Welcome to the Valley Advocate Podcast, featuring interviews that take us deeper into the people and happenings on the local scene. For more podcasts and a closer look at what's going on in the Valley, visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Hi, this is Dave Eisenstetter. I am the editor of the Valley Advocate, and this is the Valley Advocate Podcast. I'm here with arts culture editor Gina Beavers. And we're here with Eduardo Samaniego. He is a youth worker and advocate of... Uh, for, you know, immigrant rights and workers' rights here in Northampton. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Could have done that. Yeah. Well, okay. Good. 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 <laughs> well, yeah. We are I'm super so glad to be we here. We are super. Ja- we, yeah. We are very glad happy to have you. you. Um. Yeah. There's so much going on around this now. I mean, I think so. We're we're recording this on a specific day. It's going to come out on a different day. But I think one of these hardline immigration bills just went down in flames in the U.S. House. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day. Um. But all along, you've been kind of organizing here at the community and state level, uh, trying to get people. Um, knowledgeable and and uh, interested and riled up about this topic and maybe you could talk a little bit about how that's been going yeah no absolutely um, well first of all thank you for having me again I'm so happy to be with you guys and uh, this is an incredible service so necessary to inform our community um, well right now um, you know the worker center is invested in a couple projects uh, one of them is our latest campaign for um, the four provisions that would you know, ensure that immigrants in Massachusetts have the most basic rights to, uh, to due process mm-hmm. in our state. So that fight has been going on over the past few months here in our state. Um, and so that's what my work has been part of. Um, you know, I've been able to organize um, about, you know, a couple hundred of students, uh, community members and advocates from, you know, the Panner Valley um, to come with us to the Boston State House, well, to the Massachusetts State House, and urge our Speaker DeLeo to take action and protect you know, families here in our state because as much as, yes, there is a crisis at the border, there is also a crisis here in our homes. Uh, you know, families such as Lucio Perez's family, mm-hmm. you know, they've been separated for the past eight months. He's been living in this church. He doesn't have the opportunity to... In, um, in Amherst. Yeah, in Amherst, yes. Uh, and he doesn't have the opportunity to... Uh, you know, kids or ch- his children good night to wake them up in the morning to drop them off at school. They're also separated, and so um, these four provisions at the, the at the you know uh, hands of Speaker DeLeo would ensure that immigrants uh, such as Lucio, um, you know, when they're stopped by by any routine uh, uh, you know checkpoint or uh, you know even if they skip a stop sign mm-hmm. and you know you know the police officers in our state. Uh, should not be invested in asking people about their immigration status. Their job is to make that our community is safe. And what are, so you said there's four things. What are mm-hmm. they? Yes, yeah, so um, it basically, um, you know, the four provisions uh, say a couple of things. One is that uh, uh, local uh, police will no longer work with federal authorities. So all 287G contracts will be terminated in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, we know that the federal government too often uses this 287G contracts to deputize local police uh, uh, members as you very much, you know, part of ICE, right. and you know they are there in our communities looking for families to take, and so we want that to end. Uh, we also want our local police officers to not have the opportunity, because it's not at all necessary to ask uh, people about their immigration status uh, for any reason. Uh, third, we want to make sure that when immigrants are detained, they are read their rights mm-hmm. and that they know they are informed that they have the right to have a lawyer when they speak with anyone from immigration. Uh, that's something that is not afforded to immigrants in our state today, and that's something that these four provisions would do, um, as well as a couple um, of other things. Uh, for example, what the fourth would be very uh, much a uh, uh, no registries for you know uh, in in terms of you know people's religion or race or right. gender nationality. We should not use people's infor- We should not use people's informations, you know, to go after them in our state. Right. So that's what those provisions would yeah. do. It's super easy. Right. Most basic things. This is a compromise that we really don't want because it's not enough. But it, it would be a start, and so we're pushing for yeah. that. Let me clarify something. Did, yeah. did you say the Miranda rights? So uh, it, it's basically that when immigrants go, the, go into a detention center, 
uh, an immigration officer can just come and ask them questions. And they're not told that uh, they can have a lawyer with them gotcha. before that happens. Mm. Okay. Um, and so, you know, as we know, for immigrants, uh, because really they haven't committed any crime, mm -hmm. you, know, we, you know, when they come here, they're not really going through the criminal justice system. Right. They're going through the immigration you know, yes. uh, courts. And so in that case, they're not afforded a lawyer, right. just like anyone else, you know, a U.S. citizen would. And so we want to at least in our state, you know, be able to tell them, you know, you can request a lawyer if right. you want to uh, in order for us to ask you these questions, you know. So and how and how is that going? I mean, how are you doing in in uh, enacting those four provisions, getting that getting that over the yeah. line? Uh, yeah, I mean, to be completely honest, I am incredibly disappointed in mm. our elected officials. I have lived in a ruby red state, the state of Georgia, before, yes. right. where Republicans controlled the three, ha you know, houses of, of uh, government, and um, they obviously go after immigrants. But then I come here to the state of Massachusetts, where at one point we've had the three, you know, houses of government controlled by all Democrat mm -hmm. uh, representatives, and. We have absolutely zero to show for, you know, in terms of immigrant rights here in our states. And so we're doing the best we can. Yesterday, we saw thousands of people pouring into the Capitol. We know that people are angry. People are uh, frustrated with our elected officials. And yes, there are some of those who have come out and who have you know, cl uh, uh, stated clearly that they do not stand with Trump, that they do not stand with Governor Charlie Baker, and that they want every Massachusetts family to be protected. And yesterday, I saw the state of Massachusetts come out as I've never seen it before, mm. and I'm excited because for the first time since I've been here in Massachusetts, I was shocked to see uh, you know, how people are so moved and so touched to go out there and knock on the doors of Speaker DeLeo to demand that he protects right. uh, families here. So, so tell us your story, Eduardo. Yeah, and you're you're an uh, you're an undocumented immigrant yourself. Yeah, yes, I am. Um, I came here when I was 16 years old, and um, you know, for different reasons, I eventually lost my status. Um, my family, you know, has has never been here in the United States. What country? Um, I came originally from Mexico to the state of Georgia and uh, you know I worked hard I went to high school there in the state of Georgia that's where I learned English I was taken in by a pastor from the church in Kennesaw where I lived um, you know Pastor Agustin Vega and he supported me through my last year of high school I eventually ended up graduating as the student body president of my high school president of junior achievement president of Hispanic Honor Society but when I was finally ready to go to college you know, I walk into my counselor's office and I have my application on hand to send to the University of Georgia. And I left that office of my advisor with tears in my eyes and just my dreams just shattered because that's when I found out for the first time that I actually didn't have a social security number. You didn't know. I did not know, and she told me that you know the Georgia border regions had just passed a, a new policy three months ago, uh, in 2010, uh, and uh, basically prohibiting everyone in the state of Georgia who doesn't have a, a, a social security number from even applying to the top five colleges in the state of Georgia. These are the same five colleges that during the 1960s prohibited even African Americans from applying to these same five colleges. So we are seeing history repeating in different ways mm. and affecting our communities. I eventually, yes, was able to come here with a full ride scholarship to Hampshire College uh, because of so many people working together, but you know, it's not enough. And so my work, you know, that's my work, you know, ensuring that uh, we're pushing for access to education for people of color, that we are pushing for protections for immigrant families, and uh, you know, that we make Massachusetts a more welcoming state for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so. you, you've also been working on an immigrant bill of rights in addition to the four provisions you were talking about before in terms of getting driver's licenses and in-state tuition. How's that going? And, and what kind of, um, what kind of uh, uh, support or opposition have you receive on um, those ideas yeah um, so I would say that um, our before this um, the the latest fight that we that we were having you know in, in the nation was the dream act you know mm -hmm. they push for the dream act 
And you know, we know that from Massachusetts, we were able, we were able to turn out people from here to Washington D.C., to New Hampshire, to um, also support you know our neighbors in our in their states, pushing their senators to support the Dream Act. And so um, we know that the overwhelming majority of people support the Dream Act. You know, but at the moment, the 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 Senate is controlled by Republicans, and the House is controlled by Republicans, and they have been not been able to come to the table, uh, you know, and compromise uh, with just common sense measures. You know, we have at the table people like S Stephen Miller. Uh, you know, before it was you know Steve Banner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Stephen Miller is uh, w one of the White House uh, policy advisors, who's a very hardline immigration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, kind of anti-immigration. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could call it like an anti-immigrant, yeah. just yeah. you know, anti white supremacist. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. why he is. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. and I think that you know there is no doubt about that. There has been so much uh, context to his anti-immigrant stances since he went to you know UC Berkeley in California, and so you know in so many of his speeches, uh, Stephen Miller. Uh, in, in, in stages in front of thousands of people would make fun of the people cleaning the college. You know, uh, he would request insane things such as, you know, he would throw the, the trash right next to them and he would ask them to pick it up. Mm. You know, so this dude is now running our immigration apparatus in the United States. And this is exactly why we're in this mess right now because yeah. of Stephen Miller, Donald Trump, and, you know, Secretary Nielsen. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's a trifecta right there. Yep. Um, it really is. But, e <laughs> but, but even, even in the state of Massachusetts, there are, uh, aren't there some things that, that our own state legislature could do to counteract what's going on at the federal level? So, yes, I think that, you know, this is the opportunity that we have at the table right now where the Senate has already adopted these four provisions mm -hmm. in their final budget proposal. Now, this budge budget from the Senate has to be conciliated with the House of Representatives and so right now they're debating it in the conference committee where senators and representatives, you know, write the final budget bill that they will send to Governor Baker. And the House representatives are holding hostage mm -hmm. these four provisions. The Senate has already approved them, but representatives, House representatives led by Speaker DeLeo have not come out to support these provisions. I don't know what we need to do to come to the point where they see that Massachusetts is in a, in a whole different place mm. and that they are stalling progress in our state, mm. you know, whether it is on criminal justice reform, whether it is on the minimum wage, mm -hmm. whether it is on, you know, protections for immigrants. Those who fall dies in our state will say that, yes, we are, you know, continuing the progress that we've had for the past 30 years in Massachusetts. But, you know, as someone who is out there engaged with different communities, we know that that's not true. Our state is 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 stalled. It's stuck, and we need to get out of there. And and you know now is the time for for our you know speaker and for our legislature to do the right thing and stand up to Trump by passing these four provisions in our state. I'd love to know kind of what you make of the additional attention that this um, family separation policy has had. I mean, I think that uh, for a long time, immigration has been. Uh, an issue that people have thought about, but I think that the recent uproar we've seen has been a whole new level, and I wonder what what it's been like for you to to kind of observe that and what your thoughts are about that. Oh yes, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bring it on. What yeah. are you? What are they? I mean, you know, this is one of the most horrendous images I could have imagined in my head. You know, and and to see children being separated from their mothers. You know, as as young and three, four, five months old, being ripped away from from a mother's arm, to be put in cages, to be able to have to be taken. You know, these kids are being taken care by other children of other immigrants. Imagine that image, mm -hmm. how distressing, the cries, the calls for their mommies and their dads. It's it is this is the most horrendous thing that we could ha be having in our country right now, and. You know, one of the things that I take a bit of frustration with is with people saying things such as, and I quote, this is not the country I know. Right. You know, this is not America hmm. because this is us and we have seen it before. We yeah. Have we have seen, seen it. Seen it. Number of times. Yeah. We have seen it when we took away the children of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. We have seen it when we took away the children of black 
slaves in our country. We have seen it when we had the internment camps mm -hmm. uh, in the 1930s. We have seen this before, and these images are horrendous, and it, sh it will be a shame that we have to carry for the rest of our lives, that this happened under our watch. And so I think that now the people are coming out. People are, you know, infuriated and they're furious because this is happening. But we have to take action, collective action, and we have to move on from that narrative that this is not our country right. to we must defund the Border Patrol. We must abolish ICE and we must ensure that these agencies that we have created are not using our taxpayer dollars to go after our families, to go after our black and brown children, to go after, you know, mothers and fathers. We have to make sure that our taxpayers uh, money is not going to do what we've done for so many, you know, generations. Take, you know, out our anger on the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where we are today. And I feel there is hope that, uh, you know, and my hope is for people to take action. Right. You know, at this moment, as an undocumented immigrant myself, uh, this is no moment to ask for permission. This is no moment to be afraid. This is moment for courage, and that's what I want my community to have, to have courage and to demand what is right. I think when we do that, we are doing our best. And, and uh, right now, you know, that's what we want Speaker Delia to do, to do what is right and to do what is, you know, what has been demanded of him by the great majority of Massachusetts residents. And it, that is passing these four provisions and sending a strong message that the state of Massachusetts does, does not want to be complicit with what the Trump administration in, is doing at the border and across this country. And with the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and a lot of other um, activist groups, I understand that there's going to be another action at the end of the month, on the 30th. Is that right? Maybe you could talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes. So we will have a couple of different actions, uh, but there is one in particular. This is the one on June 30th that, that you were mentioning. And basically in this action, we'll be talking about um, uh, family separation at the border for sure, but also family separation in within our own borders of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Yeah. You know? That means that, you know, every day families are separated in Massachusetts right. because they cannot afford, you know, a you know, two bedroom apartment here in Massachusetts with our minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, families are being separated because their moms and dads are being sent to prison simply because they smoke weed on the street. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, family separation for all those reasons and because of our immigration laws. And uh, Lucio will be speaking at uh, Fish Churches of Amherst on June 30th next to uh, Congressman McGovern. Mm. who will be joining us on that mm -hmm. uh, that day, as well as a couple of their community leaders and, and faith uh, leaders in, across the Pioneer Valley. So uh, we invite everyone to come on June 30th, uh, First Churches of Amherst, and you know it should be powerful, and it, this is a moment, an opportunity for you to stand with us, and we'll have action items for you to take action right there with us. And yeah, I think you know what we're doing is, it's you know, our very, um, you know, on communities effort, you know, and, and uh, I think that's something powerful to see, so to change something. Yeah, right. that, I mean, what an exciting uh, action that people is, can take a, take exciting. part of. We'll have to make Pardon. sure we have the address. Yes, <laughs> please. Yes. Yeah, yes. For, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. well, you know, if it, if it's Lucio, you know where to find him. So true. right. Yeah. No, he's, um, he's yeah there. Well, and and uh, as far as other actions, you yourself have have walked I think it was 250 miles yeah maybe you could talk about how that went yeah yeah oh maybe. my gosh <laughs> let me just mas massage February? my legs a little bit because yeah. that hurt I, was that, February uh, or? that was at the end of, at the end of the year actually at I, th the end I think of the year. right wait no you're right it yeah this year. you have the date yeah, yeah it was it was yeah, I it was, was cold it was it gonna was be cold. yes yeah. yes it was it was it was definitely in February yes that's right and so, you know, for that, um, what we did is, you know, we created this action around the, the push for the DREAM Act. Um, and, you know, 11 of us walked 250 miles from New York to Washington, D.C. 11 of us, why? 
because there is 11 undocumented immigrants living in the United States. 11 million, million. right? Yes. 11 yeah, million. Right. Yes. <laughs> All 11 of you got together. No. Yes. I yeah. know, right? <laughs> but 11 yes, 11 million. And I think that, you know, that's often forgotten. We are diminished, you know, to numbers mm -hmm. and statistics and quotes and, and books and, and dehumanized you know, press releases. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, that walk was for that. So the community could see us face to face. We had, you know, uh, different stops every day in different cities. Uh, we came to churches, synagogues. We stopped along the way and, and we talked about, you know, what we wanted our immigration system to look like. And um, it's nothing like it, it currently is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know. How was your reception in these different cities? I I was um, I was overwhelmed to be honest. That was again, you know, it's it's something that I always find, you know. Yes, yeah, like you know, you are amazed and shocked sometimes by the support and the amount of people that comes out to these actions. But I guess I could share just one experience. There was at one point where we came to a neighborhood in southern Pennsylvania. This neighborhood welcomed us, and let me tell you, they had food, they had clean clothes, oh. they had you know their showers ready to offer for us. It was 18 families, hmm. 18 families that hadn't spoken to each other before that day. Wow. Because exactly. This is what people do when, when you're asking for support and the support is legitimately coming from the people that are affected. And so these families came together for the first time to make sure that we had a place to stay, you know, for the night. And they told us, you know, when we heard that the dreamers were coming through here, we knocked on each other's door and we talked to each other for the first time and we came together and we made this happen. And I think that was like something that is honestly we saw it in every stop you know that's that's something that we saw it as as so so moving and so personal and so so powerful because that's the power of people coming together um but then you know right there i think i'm reminded of the fact that yes these people are out there and in very rural communities who support immigrants who are here in the united states dreamers and and parents and families but you will never see them on mainstream media yeah you will never see the outreach of these families mm -hmm. but yes you know these these mainstream outlets you know they go out there and they drive four or five six hours into the darkest places and they find the most racist people and they go and they put them on a panel on primetime television <laughs> yeah so that they could they could say whatever the misinformation they've heard and they've been fed yeah. for for the past so many years and that angers me and that tells me there is something very very wrong with the way that we're transmitting information it's ups mm -hmm. it's yeah. very upsetting i mean as and i want to hear people, from you guys yeah well as you would know better than yeah I, well as, as people who are you know like kind of we've got uh, you know, we know people who do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> like it's you it's know? just it's super disappointing, and I think that immigration really there's an opportunity for it to, as you describe, be a topic that brings people together, really shows our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, people learning each other's stories from different places, and it's something that we lose in this echo chamber of. Yeah. Just, you know, hatred that gets yeah. amplified as you're describing. This, there's this yeah. rise of the culture wars yes. in the United States in the last few years that people are, these people are playing to the worst inclinations. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people with the worst inclinations. Yes. And they seem to be much more vociferous right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the first time. So, yeah, I watch CNN. I can't watch Fox. Uh, I, have to be I can't, I mean, I'll, I oh, cannot yeah. do it. Um, but I'll watch CNN and I'll watch. I don't recommend too. it. Yeah, I re don't recommend. No, it's kind of like it's like oh, if anybody just yeah. you know, I won't well, Disney's gonna buy them pretty well, soon, so maybe that too. It's kinda like, <laughs> they'll have like some Cinderella, cartoon characters know, like on these panels too. One can only hope. <laughs> really, right? But I watch these people go at it, you know, head to head, and it's really no holds barred now. I mean, where yeah. there used to be some semblance of of subject uh, objectivity, <laughs> rather, I should say, um, and professionalism. 
It doesn't Absolutely. exist anymore. There, there are things in the country, there are topics in the country of race and immigration that have, um, it's, it's become a toxic, a toxic situation that yes. people cannot have. Yeah. A lot of people cannot have civil convers- conversations about it. Yeah. I, I'd love to know kind of with that reality in mind, like what you do as someone who is an undocumented person or an undocumented resident um, where you're at, uh, when you approach someone who may just be a middle of the road person who doesn't pay attention or, or whatever in this environment where there's so much hatred and misinformation out there, how, how do you approach someone like that? How do you, how do you just kind of tr- try to connect with, um, with somebody? Yes. And I think, you know, that right there, I think I would want anyone who's listening to pay attention uh, right here because I have lived in the South. I have mm-hmm. lived in the state of Georgia. This is a supermajority Republican. This is a uh, Trump country where I lived. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, we've gone to the point where, yes, the information that is being spread is not even the legitimate feelings of most people right. in these areas. But, you know, we've come to this point where we're trapped in this, you know, echo chamber mm-hmm. that we can't escape. I remember when I came to this country going and sitting with my neighbors on their porch and drinking sweet tea. And this, honestly, you know, my neighbors were, you know, pretty racist, (laughs) you know. And I think that, you know, I would remember they would always tell me this. And back then I would not think about it. But now it's different. They would tell me things like this. Um, You know, we want you here. We like you. You know, we're so glad that you're here. But we don't want other people here. You know, and so I think that that there is that point where why is it that they were saying that to me? Because I was right next to them. Right. I was their neighbor. They couldn't right. avoid me. Right. They had to talk to me. Right. I went to school with their children. I would hang out with their children. They would take me to their home and feed me. Mm-hmm. And I would do the same thing. I would invite my friends and my neighbors to come and eat and hang out, you know, at my house. And I feel that that connection. Uh, little by little started to break that tension in, a, in that community where I lived, you know, and not only with me, but with so many other people that were moving in, you know, a lot of them Latinos in, in this small city of Kennesaw. And I realized that uh, the misinformation that has been happening for the past, you know, many years here in the United States has detached, you know, just real people um, who might have conservative, you know, values into hating, you know, they we've talked them into hating people that they never met. Right. And so once these people actually meet, you know, uh, people who are different and who, that interact with them, but without the obvious, you know, Fox News in the middle, things are very, very different. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm not saying that that's, you know, the ultimate fix. And I'm not saying that we should send people, you know, to, to go and convert racist. What I'm saying is that, um, you know, Television and misinformation have poisoned people's minds. And we need to go back and do some work in our communities. Because at the end of the day, we see how black and brown communities, black, white communities, brown, white communities are struggling to find those legitimate ways to connect with each other. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing those connections happening at the leadership level in different organizations. But we want those conversations and, and, and that connections at the at the very bottom you know of our community and so i think that's what we're doing here we're being in the community we're informing people of of you know uh, my priorities as an undocumented person i would like to have the most basic rights to to you know due process in our state and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think those conversations are so important and i think we can change a lot of things when when we do act you know with determination to change something that we know is wrong. And, you know, I've never been afraid to call racism out. And, Yay. you know, I think, <laughs> you know, I think that that's what brought me here, right. you know, to Massachusetts. And I'm not afraid to continue to do that, you know, uh, as long as I'm here. So we have a long fight in, in Massachusetts, but that fight is being fought every, everywhere. We just got to pay attention and take leadership from amazing people that have done this before and who have succeeded. 
So. Well, Eduardo, thank you for your work. Thank you for Absolutely. your courage in um, telling your story. And thanks for, for coming and joining us. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for listening. And don't forget to visit us at valleyadvocate.com. Thank you.